Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and there's Jerry, and the three of us are easy, breezy, beautiful cover girls, and this is Stuff You Should Know. <laughs> How you doing? I'm great. Good. I'm doing I've good. i always wanted to be a cover girl. Well, you are now. I decree Yay. it such. Fantastic. (laughs) Um, I'm excited about this one, Chuck. I'm really excited because it's like a combination of one of our plant episodes with one of our animal episodes. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's really hard to not look at a Venus flytrap in action on a video and not think it's an animal. Um, Yeah, I guess so. I guess guess it's hard. (laughs) Sure. It's just so like uh, all all you can think of or all I can think of is Mm -hmm. that thing is like thinking with a brain, let me close my mouth and eat this thing. Yeah. I mean, not so much an animal, you know what I mean? That's what it looks like for sure. Yeah. But the thing is, Chuck, is there's like a there's a whole thread of um, botany now. There's like a big dispute in the botanical world about just yes, about just how much plants think. And thinking, and not necessarily in ways that we would recognize it as thinking, but still having intelligence, memory. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that that seems to be kind of emerging as far as studying Venus flytraps goes is that plants, just like us, use what are called action potentials, which is electrical transmissions that cause cells to do different things when they're stimulated. And right. that is thinking. Like, that's how we think. That's how neurons fire. So the idea that plants use the same kind of general principle to do things or to react to things or respond to things or to change the behavior— Buddy, that's thinking in a lot of ways. What's a vegan to do? I know. It does, it's definitely— it puts them in a tough spot. That's a, conu- that's a conundrum. They're going to all end up breatharians. <laughs> right. O- oxygen mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's uh, a thing. Did you know that? Breathitarians? I, I feel like I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what's, what it sounds the deal? like. So they don't eat anything? No, they just breathe. And, and drink water? Or is that off limits? I don't even know if they drink water. Probably water. Are they all dead? Eventually, I'm sure. Okay. But, uh, yeah, we'll have to do an episode on that because I don't know enough about it to speak on it intelligently. But it is pretty interesting because I know some people at least try it. Well, it sounds like a movement that would probably not gain much steam, you know? Right. Because everybody's just too (laughs) tired to proselytize about it. Sounds like a short stuff. Uh, Okay. There you go. Gotcha. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but we're here to talk about the Venus flytrap, not the WKRP in Cincinnati DJ. What a great character. He had a lot of facets. Played by, uh, uh, what was his name, Tim something, right? Tim Reed. Wow, nice. I saw a lot of WKRP when I was growing up. I did up. too, man. I love that show. Mm-hmm. It's funny, I remember, I'm already going on a tangent before we even get started, but I remember watching that show when I was little and seeing Johnny Fever wear the Grateful Dead t-shirts, which was my first exposure, and they Mm -hmm. had, like, the skeleton and stuff, Mm -hmm. and I thought they were some kind of, like, a metal thing. I did, too. I actually had a (laughs) couple of their posters, and I was like, this band must be the coolest band of all time, and I finally heard them, and I was like, this doesn't match at all. Like, the best name ever, the best imagery, and then, yeah, Yeah. it just didn't add up music-wise. Uh, But we're talking about the Venus flytrap, the plant, which if you think, sure, I've heard of those things. That's like the the one carnivorous plant. No, no, no. There are hundreds and hundreds of plants that actually eat other things Mm -hmm. by attracting things and capturing and killing them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the Venus flytrap gets all the press because it just – It looks like it looks, and it's so cool. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the other plants, um, like, eat and digest insects or even, like, some rodents. There's a kind of pitcher plant that I saw. It's the size of a toilet. Mm -hmm. And, like, if you're a mouse and you fall in, that's it for you, mouse. Um, But they don't do anything. They just kind of sit there and hope that something falls in. The thing that makes the Venus flytrap so fascinating is it's one of only two plants in the world that actually, like, closes. It actually traps. Right. And it it, it traps its prey. And, like, that's just 
you just don't see that. The other one's the European water wheel, and it looks like a fern with the very tips of each fern frond, um, kind of like Venus flytrappy. The very, very right. small version of it. The Venus flytrap is just big enough to be like, wow, that's really neat. Right. Like they would never write a character named Audrey after those ferns and put them in Broadway musicals. No. And Audrey too, technically. Audrey too? Yeah. Audrey was the guy, was Seymour's love interest, the, the girl that he liked. So he named the plant Audrey too. Can I confess something? Yeah. <laughs> I know nothing about Little Shop of Horrors. I mean, I haven't seen it in a really long time either, but I um, I went and looked up some stuff on it. Oh, okay. So you're <laughs> confessing too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw on a YouTube video this guy uh, from the Carolinas talking about the Venus flytrap, and he said a more appropriate name for them mm-hmm. would probably be, did you see this guy? Yeah. The, the, Car- the Carolina spider trap. Yeah. Because of two things. Uh, they are – Basically only found in about a 700-mile area as far as growing wild mm-hmm. along the coast of North and South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And then he said they really only eat about 5% of their diet as spiders – or I'm sorry, as uh, flies. Mm-hmm. He said they mostly eat spiders and ants. Uh, and you can also throw in crickets and slugs and some other caterpillar things in there. Yeah. I mean, you know, kind of very frequently whatever just kind of happens to to wander on to the plant itself. But, I mean, it'll take what it can get. But I guess winged insects can maybe get away faster or more easily. Yeah. I mean, I get the idea that the flies can get out of there easier. So it's just, I mean, they're fine to eat flies. They're mm-hmm. just harder. Yeah. I also, I saw, I, saw um, I don't know if it was in that same video or not, that there's only an estimated 150,000 of these plants in the wild. And that entire 700 mile, wow. just tiny strip along the coast of North and, and South Carolina. And they live in bogs, like marshy bogs, sometimes salt marshes, um, sometimes peat bogs. Uh, but, you know, like a, a wetland that's like, always wet. That's that's where they grow. Um, and they like the sun and they like it humid, but they can also weather the cold, as we'll see, because it can get pretty cold in the winter in North Carolina. So there's really no way around explaining the origins of the name mm-hmm. without it being a little, well, it's just a little dicey because <laughs> it was named at a time where uh, things were different back then. And... <laughs> They they named it because the the plant resembled uh, a, perhaps a woman's anatomy. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> no, I'm really enjoying watching you tap dance. Well, I mean, and we've talked. Uh, we may have mentioned it in the folklore episode. The idea of the vagina dentata, mm-hmm. which in many different cultures and nations around the world, it, there are these folkloric legends of these uh, women who had uh, teeth. And their <laughs> vagina act as a trap. <laughs> Keep going, Chuck. And that is where this name comes from. It's named after Venus, the go- pagan goddess of love, mm-hmm. because of that plant's resemblance and because of that folklore. Yes. Jeez. Good job, man. I think you really presented that well. All right. Um, I, I wouldn't w- name it that today. Can I say that? Uh, no, they <laughs> definitely wouldn't. Uh, people are a lot less uptight when it comes to S-E-X. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it'd be the Carolina spider trap. Yeehaw. <laughs> That's right. I also saw that when they, it was imported uh, to England for study around the mid-18th century, um, that it was popularly called tippity witchets. That's what they hmm. called Venus flytraps in England. I thought it was fun, too. And Charles Darwin said that it was one of the most wonderful plants in the world, which, I mean, that's a that's a pretty good endorsement coming from him, you know? Oh, I bet he loves the Venus flytrap. Uh, yes, he really did. And I don't think because he um, had any kind of sexual proclivities toward it like some of his other fellow botanists did who actually named it that. No, I think because it's a, a wonder of natural selection and evolution. Mm-hmm. I would say that's why, too. One we of, know that's his kink. One of the other things, he's like, oh, natural selection, yes. <laughs> Stop. Um, so one of the other things about the Venus flytrap, it has another name, too. It's um, it's a taxonomic name. is Dionea muscipula. Yeah, okay. I think that's right. And that actually is named after Diana, a different goddess, the mm-hmm. Roman goddess of the hunt. And muscipula apparently uh, means mousetrap. So the other name thing you could call it besides Venus flytrap is Diana mousetrap. 
It's not bad. It's got a lot of really great names. It I does. mean, Tippity Witchet alone is worth, you know, celebrating. I think Diana Mousetrap might be my new hotel check-in name. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, they eat insects and not because they um, just love the taste of spiders or flies. Uh, they're they're regular plants too. They love photosynthesis, mm-hmm. and they do their thing during photosynthesis, like all plants do, and take that energy of the sun and and convert it to sugar and oxygen and mm-hmm. use that stuff as energy. But they also need other stuff, just like all plants need. But they can't get it because of where they live in that peaty marshy bog. They need all these amino acids and vitamins that their land doesn't provide, Mm -hmm. and they get that from these insects. Yeah, because most other plants are able to get things like nitrogen from the soil and phosphorus and magnesium, sulfur, calcium, potassium. Like, yes, they need ATP energy, and they store it in the form of carbohydrates like all plants do. Um, But there's other nutrients that they need to build cell walls, to produce DNA, um, to uh, transport water throughout, that kind of stuff. Like, you definitely need a lot more than ATP. And since they can't get it from the soil, they have evolved to get it by eating other bugs uh, or eating bugs or, you know, even in some cases like uh, like those giant pitcher plants like mice because animals are really great mobile stores of stuff like calcium and, and sulfur and phosphorus and magnesium. That's right. And in that wet, peaty, acidic soil, uh, they must seek purchase elsewhere. And luckily those little spiders are happy to just crawl in there. And maybe we should take a little break. Mm-hmm. And we'll tell you all about how this trap happens right after this. Okay, Chuck, before we go any further, I just want to restate one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Okay. That the Venus flytrap and other carnivorous plants couldn't get nutrients from the soil they grew in, so they learned to eat bugs to get those nutrients. It's astounding. <laughs> and it also makes them so similar to the, to the animal world because that's why animals eat other stuff, like other animals or even plants, because we need to get our energy elsewhere. We don't get it from the soil. So it makes them in some weird way akin to us as well. Do you feel a kinship? A little bit. And, uh, you know, I'm a little attracted to it, too, like some of those early botanists. Oh, not in a Darwinian way. <laughs> no. Or, or both. You swing both ways? Sure. Okay. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't judge. Who knew this podcast would go in this direction? I did. <laughs> right when I saw that first thing about it being dicey. Yes. About the name being I knew exactly where it was going to go. Uh, so... They are not the only plant also that attracts things via their smells or these uh, delicious syrupy saps. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go out in your garden on any day and see butterflies and bees and other insects flying around, they're all going to these plants. And these plants are using these insects in one way or the other. They're just not quite using them up like a Venus flytrap does. Yeah, they're using them to help pollinate. That's why they do that. Yeah, because they want the bee to fly away. Right. Right. They, uh, the Venus flytrap does not want anything to fly away. No. It says, come here. Let me eat you. <laughs> so here's what happens. Uh, if you look at a Venus flytrap when it's unfolded and beautiful and has all these little beads of sweet nectar on it, an insect will land on that. And on each side of, uh, uh, what are they called, petals? Uh, I saw lobes. Okay. And yeah, then I the, like that. The thing that connects them in the middle is called the midrib. The midrib? Uh huh. Not the <laughs> mick rib. The <laughs> midrib. It's good eating. You only get it at certain times of the <laughs> That's year. Right. Uh, on each lobe, you've got three little trigger hairs arranged in a little triangular pattern. Mm-hmm. And these are part motion detectors and part sort of timers almost. Because when a little fly or a spider or any kind of insect that's small enough lands in there, and we should say by small enough, we mean ideally about a third of the size of those two lobes. Mm -hmm. Can't go much bigger than that. No, and they're not big. It's not a big plant. I saw that they grow to be about five inches tall. 
Yeah, they're small. Yeah, they're fairly small. And then each plant will have, you know, f- f- between five and ten, I think, um, fly traps on it. Yeah, it's like if you get your information from Little Shop of Horrors, you're being misled. <laughs> right. Um, so you've got these little trigger hairs, and once one of those is is flicked by a fly leg or an ant leg or a spider, it sort of a timer kind of starts. And they've got about 20 or 30 seconds to dance around that thing without hitting either that one again or one of those other trigger hairs. Mm -hmm. And once it hits the second one or hits that first one the second time within that little timer, that is when the trap closes in a fraction of a second. Yeah, like the blink of an eye. Oh, yeah. It's super quick. Um, And, you know, I think one of the things that makes it seem animal-like is it's it's really hard to find a nature documentary about the Venus flytrap without – some sort of foreboding orchestral music playing <laughs> yeah. in the background. Yeah, for sure. So it really kind of juices it up a little bit. Uh, but here's the deal is they don't <laughs> they don't know exactly why or exactly how the mechanism works since it doesn't have a brain. You know, they know they trigger that trigger hair and then it claps shut, but all they've got is a pretty good hypothesis. Yeah, so what they think happens is that the, the, um, the lobes stay open um, like that, you, I, you could just um, uh, liken it to a mouth. So the mouth is wide open on the Venus flytrap. By the cells around that, the lobe, I guess around the midrib and the lobe where they connect, are basically being crumpled. And then something about the um, trigger hairs being stepped on starts to um, decrumple that. It starts to release a little bit of the pressure. And then when that second hair is triggered, the pressure is fully released. And they think what happens is through the use of, um, of burning ATP for energy, that the, the, the water pressure changes in those cells so that they go from being crumpled to being plump. And so they're no longer holding the uh, flower open or the mouth open. So it just shuts. And all of that is, again, carried out by those action potentials, which starts with the trigger hair being stimulated, which somehow creates an electrochemical um, transmission that goes through the plant cells to tell it, get ready, get ready, because it might happen again. And when it happens again, it says, okay, release the water. And then the thing snaps shut, which is pretty neat. But even after that, even after that second stimulation and Mm. the um, (laughs) the mouth closes, that's not the end of the whole process. Like, that's there's still another third one, and it has to do with those amazing trigger hairs as well. Yeah, like this <clears> to <throat> me, it's already pretty remarkable yeah. that this plant can do this. And and I knew, I kind of knew all that stuff, but this is when it really floors me because I, even before I got to this part, I started thinking like, well, yeah, but how long does this take and to like reset the trap? Like, what if a, what if something kind of floats through there that's not an insect and it just happens to trigger two of those hairs, Mm -hmm. you know, does it just open right back up? Does it spit it out? Like, ooh, I don't want this thing in there. Mm -hmm. What if some dumb little kid sticks his finger in there? Yeah. It's going to close, of course, because it's triggering the trigger hairs. Yeah, and you should not do that, by the way. No, you should totally not do that. But, you know, that's why I said dumb little kid. (laughs) Sure. So what it counts on is a living thing squirming around in there once it's sort of you know, it's not sealed tight exactly at the very, very beginning. It's, right. it's like shut. Ideally, they're not getting out, but maybe a fly can slip out if it's quick enough, or maybe it can work its way out. But all that's doing is triggering those little trigger hairs again. Right. And that's the signal, basically, that like, no, 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 you've got a living thing in here. It's not a, a, a something that fell off a tree or whatever that you don't want. So now is the time where you really, really close down and lock down tight. Yeah, once the thing's been inside squirming. Because like you're saying, it's it's like it's got a live one here. One of the other things that just I found absolutely astounding, Chuck, is when the when the um, Venus flytrap seals shut, when it's like, okay, I've got a bug in here and I want to go ahead and start eating it, the, the little things that look like teeth, the cilia, mm-hmm. they lace together and form an airtight seal. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, it keeps the bug from escaping, which it couldn't really get out after the second the second hair was tripped. Like, it forms a cage. But then after it squirms around inside that cage, then it seals tight, airtight. And that's it for the bug, by the way. Um, and it keeps the bug inside. It also keeps um, 
uh, bacteria from entering because this is not a fast process, what, what's about to happen. It takes the course of days before it's completed. And in that time, bacteria can enter through any like hole in that seal. And so the seal prevents bacteria from getting in and rotting the bug and in turn rotting the um, the, the um, Venus flytrap, causing the poor little flytrap to turn black and fall off. So I saw it takes about an hour or two to fully seal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes about you remember I said earlier, like, what if something just happens to go? How long does it take to reset the trap? Right. That takes about 12 hours if there's a, uh, I like don't know. Like a twig or something? It. Some debris? Yeah, but I was looking for kind of a fun word for a, that's not sexual. <laughs> How about a, um, a, uh, twi- uh, like a false alarm, but my mind just keeps going to dirty places. Well, like what? I, I have no idea. Yeah, a false you... alarm. Let's just call it No, that. no. What, nice what were you going to think that was dirty? What were you thinking that was dirty? Well, I can't. I'll tell you later, I guess. I can't say it out loud. <laughs> I got to figure this out. Oh, just, oh, I know what you mean. Let's just say it's a false alarm. Mm-hmm. About 12 hours. And then the entire digestive process can take a week or more. Yeah, like if there is an actual bug in there, it takes a, about a week to digest it. It doesn't sound like a pleasant way to go for a bug to be trapped in a Venus flytrap because after that seal is completely sealed, would you say it takes about a couple hours, an hour or two for that seal to be airtight? Yes. The whole time that bug is still alive, Chuck, and it's still just sitting there flipping and flopping against those trigger hairs. Mm -hmm. And this is the other service that the trigger hairs provide that I referred to earlier, that when they're stimulated again after this thing is sealed, what they're doing is telling the Venus flytrap, oh, okay, this thing's about this size. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a big thing. It's about medium size. So I only need to release, you know— a little bit of digestive enzymes. And this is a really great adaptation because it's really energy um, intense to produce digestive enzymes. Um, So the fact that it just kind of doles out just as um, enough to dissolve whatever's in there, whatever size insect is in there, is Mm -hmm. pretty astounding. And it judges this somehow, some way, in a mindless sort of way, by th- how much those uh, trigger hairs are tripped while the thing is is squirming around in the ceiling um, flytrap. It's just awesome that it can do that. Yeah, I mean, and this, this jumps to the end a little bit, but... The reason it does that is because it can only do that so much. Mm-hmm. Um, they do they do recycle what they can from those juices at the end of the process, but I get the feeling like each with each opening and digestion and manufacturing of those enzymes and recycling of, of what they can of those enzymes, mm-hmm. it just gets a little bit less and a little bit less until eventually the lobes uh, can't do their job anymore, and then they just stay open and say, "All right, I'll just be a regular plant." And soak up the sun. I'm just going to photosynthesize, brother. Uh, I showed my daughter that this morning when uh, before she left for school, I was watching these videos. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, man, she's going to love this. And she watched it and got really sad about the fly. Oh, that's sweet. And it's because of the way they shoot these. They do that dramatic music. Yeah. And she's conditioned. You know, she's been Disneyfied. So it's <laughs> like it's Bambi's mom in there, you know? Yeah, it's Bambi's fly mother. Or it's uh, it's Dory. Sure. Dory or the Nemo, fly version. <laughs> Just show her a fly close up. Or have her listen to our flies episode and she'd be like, I don't care. I know. Um, the other thing they do that really kind of um, is really easy to overlook, but definitely perhaps overly dramatizes a Venus flytrap shutting on a fly, is they'll very often dub in like a panther's roar right when it um, right when it shuts. <laughs> And it's, you can't pick it out unless you're looking for it. Right. But when you are, <laughs> it just sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, I think they get about 10 to 12 uh, either partial or complete closures per lobe set. So mm-hmm. that's how long they can hang in there before they coast into retirement. Mm-hmm. Not a bad run. And when you consider that uh, they're only eating an insect every like week or two maybe – yeah. In the wild. So about three times a month. Yeah. So multiply that times 10 to 12, and that, that's your lifespan, basically. Although I did see that they can live 20 years in the wild. Well, because they'll regenerate new lobes eventually, sure. right? Yes. So, yeah, they grow from a rhizome, and those things pop up. But the plant itself, that's a fairly long-lived plant. 
Yeah. What, so, okay, so inside, so one, one thing I, th- I feel is worth, like, explicitly mentioning here. You, with the Venus flytrap, you've got this open mouth, and then when it closes, it converts into a stomach. It's kind of mm-hmm. like one of those washers that's also a dryer once the wash cycle's over, right? I've always wanted one of those. Yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool. I, like, I've why never, are they all that? I've never heard if they actually, like, work or not, but maybe we'll just we'll, we'll go in Dutch on one together. Okay. <laughs> and see, we'll just trade it off month to month. Well, we'll rent a, I don't have room for it, neither do you. Okay. We'll rent a storage space. Yes. And we'll, we'll just buy a little single unit. Mm-hmm. We'll hire uh, an electrician and a plumber uh-huh. to come out and outfit yes. it for a washer dryer combo. Right. And uh, our, our bunk beds from the old days will be moved in there just for nostalgia. Yeah, but this time we'll be able to wash our sheets. <laughs> So it sounds like a plan. Uh, so in this, in this, what's went from the mouth now the stomach, those digestive juices just enough to to melt basically the bug that's in there based on its size and its squirminess. Um, they flood this thing, and again over the course of like five to twelve days, um, it's going to basically break down all the soft tissue inside that bug inside its exoskeleton and basically liquefy into goo until it just kind of mixes in with the digestive juices, right? And then in this mouth that's now become a stomach, the nutrients that that fly or that spider or that ant carried around with it uh, that became liquefied are broken down into like really tiny basic particles, like amino acids and stuff, not even like proteins, like even more basic than that. And then the plant absorbs it just like you do in your gut, right? Mm-hmm. And it uses those nutrients to do things like build cell walls or repair its DNA or to transport water throughout its body. Just not so stuff, right? And then there's one other trigger. There's one other signal that happens where when the um, digestive enzyme is basically all that's in there, all the nutrients have been sucked out, somehow it is able to, um, to analyze the ratio of digestive juice to nutrients. And when there's basically nothing but digestive juices left, it reabsorbs the digestive juice. And that acts as a trigger for those cells to compress again and the mouth to come back open. And then ideally, a gentle breeze will blow away what's left. Mm -hmm. There's a little exoskeleton in there. Yeah. And then Audrey's ready again. Uh, and, you know, again, about a week to 12 days, it depends on how big, you know, if it's a little ant, it's going to be quicker. Sure. Uh, we mentioned that the juices get weaker. So if it's an older uh, trap or set of lobes, it's going to take a little longer. And then the temperature can actually speed it up a little bit. If it's if it's warmer and there's more heat, yeah, sure. then there's going to be a faster breakdown. So that'll also speed it along. Yeah. Just Good amazing, stuff. man. I mean, I knew it was going to be an amazing like topic, but I, I was even astounded by how amazing these things are. But we're not done. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and tell you all about if you want to grow one of these monsters in your house, what you can do right after this. All right. If you're a fan of Broadway or <laughs> evolution or Charles Darwin or ancient folklore or just freaking out your neighbor's kids or your own kids or grandkids mm-hmm. and you want a Venus flytrap in your house, you can do that. You don't have to live in the Carolinas. You just have to set up an environment that is like you're in the Carolinas in your home somewhere. Yes. You have to become a Tar Heels fan. Or outside your home. Yeah, because I, you know, I mean, I'm sure in the Atlanta Piedmont, in probably parts of Alabama, in North Florida, you could probably grow these things in a pot outside. Probably so. Um, But if you live in, um, say, a much colder area, um, you know, above the Mason-Dixon line probably, or in a much drier area like the Southwest, you're going to have to, you're going to have to unnaturalize it a little bit. For example, if you live in a low humidity area, you would want to probably put this thing in a terrarium. Yeah, and that's, I've I've always wanted a terrarium. I think they're fun. Sure. So uh, get a terrarium, make it wet in there. Uh, You're going to have a, 
you know, I think I think about a four inch pot is a decent starter pot. Yeah. And you may not need anything else actually because they're really not that big, like you said. Yeah. And you got to keep checking that soil. You don't want it. Um, you don't want it swimming in water, but you definitely don't want it to dry out at any point. Yeah, and you also don't want to um, water it from above. I didn't see why, but I suspect that it might, like a raindrop could conceivably cause it to um, to close accidentally if you got enough water splattering on it and triggering those those trigger hairs. Oh, I wonder if they grow in the wild uh, under more densely covered areas yeah, to prevent that. That's possible. But um, so what you do is you you water them from the bottom up. You place them in a pan of or a little tray of standing water, about a third of an inch or a centimeter deep. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. <laughs> what w- watering tips with Josh? Well, listen. There's one. Of, there's <laughs> something else that you want to keep in mind. That I think most people wouldn't realize is like you uh-huh. can't you can't water these guys with tap water. Um, oh, I just got what reference you were making, you putts. <laughs> So, How much standing water do we need? Uh, like a million feet worth of, okay. <laughs> of water. Like you you basically want to make sure that your house is completely flooded with water <laughs> to make these things live. Uh, no, you bring a good point, though. It needs – you can't – like tap water is no good, and, and probably most of the filter water you're using is probably no good either. No, because the salts and nutrients will build up in the soil, and these things have – evolve not to use that stuff and like it will actually harm them for the same reason you don't want to use fertilizer either they don't need fertilizer they need bugs basically yeah they said and i thought this is really cool just collect some rainwater that's that's your best bet Mm -hmm. uh if you can't collect enough if you you know live in phoenix and you want to grow a venus flytrap you're already kind of rowing upstream (laughs) yeah but um you may not be able to collect that rainwater either so at least get some uh uh, deionized water, mm-hmm. maybe some distilled water, or if you've got a reverse osmosis system, which you might in Phoenix, hmm. then you can use that stuff too. You can use that stuff. And if you don't have a reverse osmosis system, you can buy it usually at any aquarium store. They sell that. Okay. Um, so the water is very important. What kind of water you use? Again, don't use fertilizer. Um, and apparently, uh, because they grow in areas that get cold in the winter, if you are growing one in a terrarium, from November to February, you want to take it out of a terrarium and, and like, put it in a window in your garage or something like that. Like, let it actually get cold. And you're going to get freaked out because the the plant will actually die back to the rhizome, and it'll look like you lost it or something like that. But then come March, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when it comes bouncing right back. Yeah, and you can treat it like uh, any plant that you overwinter that kind of goes dormant. Uh, You can clip off uh, the dead detritus, and it'll grow back. Mm -hmm. Uh, How many? How many of those are we going to get per plant? Like four or five? I think it's a five to ten somewhere. Oh, five to ten, even okay. That's what I saw, but I could be making that up. There's a lot of numbers flying around in this one. (laughs) Um, But what about the feeding? You know, it's. uh, if you have this thing in your house or in a terrarium, mm-hmm. you're not just going to count on a rando fly that got in or or a lucucaracha to <laughs> to walk into its midst. Mm-hmm. So just like if you have a constrictor and you got to you know go to the pet store to pick up some mice, sure, you're gonna have to feed this thing. Yeah, apparently um, you can feed it live bugs, but you know there's problems with live bugs. Apparently, live mealworms can actually burrow their way out of the plant, which is not pleasant for the plant, I'm sure. Um, Crickets can easily get too big or can stick a leg out, which will keep that seal from getting airtight so they can can, uh, decompose uh, from bacteria that gets slipped in that can actually make the plant decompose too. So your best bet is to get some freeze-dried mealworm, bloodworms, or crickets, uh, put a little water on there, stir them up, and then you put it uh, drop it on the um, the plant in its mouth, basically. And so um, you might get a closure response from just dropping it in there because it might hit a couple of cilia. But don't forget, like, it's not going to start releasing those digestive enzymes yeah. until its cilia, the little trigger hairs, are stimulated once it's closed. So you actually have to have like a little toothpick or something like that and just very lightly, very gently kind of rub those cilia so that it'll close fully and release those digestive enzymes. Right. And like you said earlier, don't uh, invite your neighbor's kids over to 
trigger this thing for fun mm-hmm. uh, because it only gets ten or twelve of those closures, and you're you're you know you're literally shortening the lifespan of that lobe if you're doing so for fun, right? Uh, so you got to drop an insect. You probably won't be able to catch any flies, uh, even if you're good with those chopsticks. Man, very few can accomplish that feat. Sure. You have to be friends with Pat Morita. And they got to be small. Remember, about a third the size. I told you I worked with Pat Morita once, right? Uh, no. A music video. Uh, Which one? Who's been? No, I don't think you have. I want to say it was uh, it was one Emily produced and I worked for it. Was I think it was Alien Ant Farm okay. and they did a Karate Kid send up. Okay. And Pat Morita starred and um, I was Pat Morita's guy that day to to get him what he needed in his trailer mm-hmm. and he was as nice as he could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, R.I.P. God rest his soul. And I don't think it's a big deal to say that Pat Morita loved sipping on Chardonnay during the day. On a shoot. Oh, yeah. He didn't get plastered or anything, but he, he wanted a bottle of wine, and a nice bottle of white Chardonnay, and he was just uh, a lovely guy. How positively cultured. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I heard Mr. T likes to drink huge cups of, um, I don't know what it was he was drinking, but he would, he'd would he like to drink on set as well during the day. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I did a Wycliffe video one time, and uh, he and his, his crew... They really drank. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, sometimes those music videos, that was just sort of the, um, it was just sort of a party atmosphere. Like, they would use that as an excuse to be like, all right, all my friends are coming. Right, we're right. here for 24 hours, and we're just going to get down. Yeah. And um, I also had one of the coolest experiences of my music video life on that Wycliffe job in that I was standing kind of right next to a, uh, and I'm just so square, I don't know what it's called, when they're <laughs> improv rapping and like dissing each other, like a the competition style. I don't know what that's called. Uh, it's called like a, an eight uh, mile. Yeah, it's <laughs> like called a, an eight mile face off. Okay, <laughs> that's what I said. I went, "Hey guys, nice eight mile face off." <laughs> um, but I got to kind of witness one of those in person, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It's like the talent is just off the charts. Was it so? It was good because sometimes those things are really not good. No, I mean these were these were pros. Oh, good man! That I'll bet was, that was cool to see. It was fun, but they were they were fun too. Wow. Uh, did we say everything there is to say about uh, Venus flytraps? I also had to put a joint in Buster Rhymes' lips. I think I've told that story. Buster Rhymes didn't smoke uh, pot. What? He smokes marijuana, believe it or not. Because he was in a in a in the video for Gimme Some Mo, he was fake tied to the train tracks uh-huh. in one scene. Uh-huh. So he was he was he couldn't move and oh, he was yeah. on the ground. And he would always ask me, uh, I would stand by and hold the burning blunt. And I would put it in his lips every, you know, probably eight seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. It was great. Like, those are the fun things you can do as a PA sometimes. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Those are some cool stories, Chuck. Good Lord. Yeah, you can wow. really get in the mix. Yeah. It has nothing to do with Venus flytraps, though, but. It does now. <laughs> uh, well, if you want to know more about Venus flytraps, go uh, buy one. You can buy one online, although supposedly you should probably go to a nursery that specializes in carnivorous plants because they actually know what they're talking about. So start there, okay? Can you grow them from seed? You can. You can grow okay. them from seed. You can also divide them, like as they get to be adult size, right before they come out of their winter dormancy is a good time to divide them. Nice. So they make great gifts. I love it. Uh, and since Chuck said he loves it, of course, everybody, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this Clark Me a listener mail. <laughs> okay. Did you see this one? Uh, it sounds familiar. It's from a few weeks ago. Uh, hey, guys, just want to tell you that I've been subtly weaving Clark as a verb in the conversations with my family for the last three weeks. Uh, this is uh, Leslie. This is mom that's doing this. Okay. At first, I did it just to be funny and see what they would say. None of them had heard that particular episode and don't even know about Clarking, but no one questioned it. (laughs) I asked my husband to Clark me a $10 bill, and I told my son I would Clark him a notebook for school. (laughs) And told told one of my daughters that someone could Clark her a phone charger. That's awesome. (laughs) Everyone just proceeded as if uh, I'd said nothing out of the ordinary, and it was totally surreal. (laughs) Anyway, I just had to share that with you guys because I feel like I have a hilarious inside joke with no one to laugh about it with. Oh. If you do read this on the air, and how could we not, uh, will you please shout out my husband, Clint, mm-hmm. and my kids, Jackson, uh, looks like Emma, mm-hmm. and Grace, or it may be M, mm-hmm. 
E-M-M-E. Uh, thanks for what you do. I'm a longtime listener. Love your show so much. It's perfect for those like me who have a love of learning and laughing. And that is from Leslie and her family. Just sound wonderful. And I, 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 it says something about how much they're listening to you, Leslie. I hate to break it to you. Yeah, that's pretty great. Or they're just like, mom's gone off a rocker, I guess. We'll yeah. just go with it. What Clark, a great mama, one. break. What a great email. I'm going to guess the middle kid's name is Emmy. Okay. So we've got M, Emmy, and Emma. I don't think we can miss, Chuck. Unless it's just, um. <laughs> The artist formerly known as. <laughs> uh, well, thanks again, Leslie. That was a great email. One of the all-time greats, if you ask me. And if you want to throw in your two cents and see if you can compete with Leslie's email, we would love to hear it. You can send it to us at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.